Latin with a quote from Pope Francis' encyclical on care for our common home. Pope Francis writes, there has been a tragic rise in the number of migrants seeking to flee from the growing poverty caused by environmental degradation. They're not recognized by international conventions as refugees. They bear the loss of the lives they have left behind without enjoying any legal protection whatsoever. Sadly, there is widespread indifference to such suffering, which is even now taking place throughout our world. Our lack of response to these tragedies involving our brothers and sisters points to the loss of that sense of responsibility for our fellow men and women, upon which all society is founded. Having grown up in Hong Kong and having lived and worked for many years in India and in several African countries, I'm used to living in hot places. <laughs> I did two years of high school in New Delhi, living in a house with no air conditioning, and I vividly remember sleeping out in the courtyard, trying to sleep on stifling hot nights before the monsoon arrived, hoping for the faintest breeze. As a Peace Corps volunteer in the Gambia, West Africa, when the rains came unusually heavy, I remember the water rising my village hut to six inches above the floor, soaking the legs of the furniture. I was really grateful when it stopped raining. <laughs> I guess experiences like these contribute to my reaction that for the, to the prospect by the, end, that by the end of the century, most of New Delhi's summers would be hotter than any summer in the 20th century that increased humidity because warmer air holds more, more moisture <coughs> will contribute to heavier downpours here in Michigan and the Gambia and all over the world. Since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, our human community has moved enough carbon from under the earth into the atmosphere to increase atmospheric carbon dioxide by about 700 billion tons. Yes, 700 billion tons. A little more than a quarter of this has come from the United States. For 250 million years, as the sun shone on the earth, bringing energy to living things, mostly plankton and algae, a store of carbon was established. When these organisms died, some of them sank to the bottom of swamps or of the ocean. Earth's tectonic plates shifted, and much of this organic material was crushed underground, subject to enormous pressure and heat eventually turning it into coal or petroleum. But the Industrial Revolution made these vast stores of carbon immensely valuable, setting off a great race to dig them up or pump them out and burn them, releasing their stored energy to power trains, ships, factories and cars, generate electricity, and to heat our homes. When we burn coal or oil, their carbon combines with oxygen to form carbon dioxide. About a third of that carbon dioxide has been absorbed by the oceans making them more acidic. Another quarter has returned to the land. But almost half has remained in the atmosphere, increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide from about 280 parts per million in 1850 to about 410 parts per million today. This additional CO2 captures more of the sun's energy, so it's not released back into space. So far, this has heated our planet at the surface a little more than a degree Celsius. The last time there was this much carbon in the atmosphere was about three million years ago, when Earth was two to three degrees Celsius hotter and oceans were about 20 meters higher. This heating has already contributed to unprecedented droughts, heat waves, hurricanes, and forest fires. Over 90% of Earth's additional heat has been absorbed by the oceans and together with increasing acidity, it's killing the Earth's coral reefs. Millions of people have lost homes and livelihoods, becoming climate migrants, and increased migration is contributing to anti-immigrant fervor and to a rise in populist nationalism around the world. The climate crisis is upon us, and we know it will get worse. The climate crisis is here, but what exactly is it, and how should we understand it? What should be done about it? And what should we do? Whatever else may be true, we can say for sure that of all things humans have set in motion, the climate crisis is unprecedented in scale and scope and in the reach and complexity of its consequences. It has often been said that it would end civilization as we know it, and I think this is true. But just what this means is not clear. The climate crisis is so big or unique or something 
that it exceeds boundaries and unsettles frameworks of the systems we humans have established to manage our affairs. But it's also so all-encompassing that we have no choice but to engage with it. It will affect all of us in so many ways and at every level, individual, institution, city, state, nation, and world. The choice is not if we will engage with it, but when and how. I'm encouraged in this context to see this church's climate change congregational resolution currently under consideration. In my efforts as a scholar and as a citizen to come to grips with the climate crisis, I found a number of disconnects between the ways our established systems address the crisis and purposes of these systems as I understand them. You will not be surprised, I find this deeply disturbing. I will address disconnects in three areas, in science, in economics, and in politics, with politics understood to include the structure of our institutions. We should expect natural science to give us the clearest picture it can of the physical consequences of the carbon dioxide we're adding to the atmosphere. I find, however, as do many others, that reports of the leading body of scientists addressing the climate crisis, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, established in 1988, are conservative. They've consistently underestimated changes such as increasing heat, rising sea levels, and aridification that inflict harms on humans. This is partly because the IPC is not only made up of scientists, governments have participated in setting its rules and editing its reports, and partly, I think, because the kind of cultural conservatism among scientists that is usually healthy, but in this context is, a, is misplaced. We know that in the 800,000 years before the Industrial Revolution, for which we have good data from ice cores, there were nine valleys and nine peaks of average global temperature and atmospheric CO2, and they always moved together. At the Antarctic, where this is measured, average temperatures range from about nine degrees Celsius below the present to five degrees above, while atmospheric CO2 range from 180 to 300 parts per million. Temperature changes are amplified at the poles. A change of 122 parts per million CO2 from, 18, from 180 to 300 was associated with about a six degree change in average global temperature. When CO2 was below 200 parts per million, we had ice ages. When it was above 280 parts per million, Earth was one or two degrees hotter than in the years preceding the Industrial Revolution. For the 10,000 years prior to the Industrial Revolution, CO2 was fairly stable, around 280 parts per million. Today, however, atmospheric CO2 is at 410 parts per million, having risen 130 since 1850. While in the previous period, such a rise would be associated with a six degree rise in temperature, average global surface temperature has only risen a little more than one degree Celsius, and CO2 will certainly rise above 450 parts per million in coming decades. In a business as usual scenario, it will rise to over 700 parts per million. Now, atmospheric CO2 is not the only thing affecting global temperature. There are also other greenhouse gases, and shifts in Earth's pattern of rotation around the sun were also a factor. Nevertheless, our deep geological history indicates that we should expect much more than one degree Celsius in rise in temperature from the 130 parts per million CO2 that we have added to the atmosphere. The Paris Agreement of 2015, our global plan to address the climate crisis, aims to keep the global increasing global temperature to 1.5 degrees, or at least to well below two degrees. The major IPCC report that came out last year addresses the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees, arguing that it's important to keep to 1.5 degrees. I mentioned already, however, that more than 90% of the additional heat from global heating has gone into the oceans. While heat transfer within the ocean and between the ocean and atmosphere are not well understood, earlier IPC reports stated that from carbon emissions up to then, we could expect additional heating of 0.6 degrees at Earth's surface as temperatures in the atmosphere and the ocean reach equilibrium over several decades. There are also several feedback loops where a given rise in temperature causes additional increases in heat. 
organic material frozen in permafrost that rains the Arctic thaws, releasing CO2 and methane, a much more powerful, if short-lived, greenhouse gas. Ice and snow reflect energy from the sun back into space. As ice sheets melt and snow cover diminishes, the sea and earth absorb more heat from the sun. Large stores of methane frozen in the oceans are uh, melt and are released as oceans warm. As forests become drier and hotter, forest fires increase, releasing carbon from trees into the atmosphere. And there are other potential feedback loops involving cloud cover and the chemical composition of the atmosphere that are not well understood. Since these feedback loops are not reliably quantified, they are not included in IPCC projections of global heating. Just in the last two years, our understanding of melting permafrost has improved, indicating that it could add one or two tenths of a degree to global heating in this century. With 1.05 degrees of heating so far, if we add six tenths of a degree from the oceans and one tenth from permafrost, that takes us to 1.75 degrees before we count burning in the Amazon and other forests and other feedbacks. Today, the rate of the anthropogenic carbon emissions is higher than ever in history and still rising. Carbon from established oil and coal reserves would add another half a degree, but governments and companies are still searching for more. In this context, the Paris Agreement target of 1.5 degrees and IPCC reports that support it appear to be quite misleading. The science behind IPC reports comes mainly from looking at trends from recent decades and projecting them forward, and including effects of some known physical relationships. Scientists which routinely acknowledge that their models are incomplete. More recent science generally finds larger effects. While decades of IPC reports have given less than a meter as the maximum sea level rise that, we could, be ex that could be expected in this century, they've included no sea level rise from Antarctica, the largest store of ice on the planet, now scientists are saying we could have more than a meter of sea level rise from Antarctica alone, bringing the total to at least at least two meters. While IPCC has estimated a maximum aridification of 13% of the Earth's surface by 2100, drying out that sometimes leads to, leads to the desertification from two degrees heating, Recent studies put this maximum aridification at 32%. This, these increases greatly increase potential numbers of climate migrants, economic costs, and contributions to social conflict. While climate change science has been conservative, so has climate change economics. The key economic concept is the social cost of carbon, the cost of the harms imposed when a ton of carbon dioxide is released. In economic theory, this is also the correct value for a carbon tax. Economists expect a carbon tax to be the most efficient way to reduce carbon pollution, as it causes producers and consumers to include the costs of harms from their carbon pollution in their decisions. The, the climate change congregational resolution this church is considering includes endorsing the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. This act calls for a carbon tax for the U.S of $15 per ton in 2019, rising by $10 a year, subject to further adjustments, with revenue coming back to U.S. citizens and lawful residents, such as in monthly or yearly payments. To get an idea of what this means, each $10 of carbon tax adds about 10 cents to the cost of a gallon of gas. So this act leads to a gas tax of about a dollar a gallon after 10 years. Last year, the Nobel Prize in Economics was given to William Nordhaus, the leading and most influential climate change economist. Also last year, Nordhaus published a paper proposing the social cost of carbon, $30 for 2015, rising to $49 in 2030, and $98 in 2050. Under the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, the carbon tax would be $125 in 2030, and $325 in 2050, unless it was adjusted. Also in this paper, Nordhaus finds total damages from climate change are 2.1% of global income at three degrees of warming, and 8.5% of income at six degrees of warming. 
I find he is saying six degrees of warming would only reduce global income by 8.5%, quite alarming. From my reading, this would certainly end civilization as we know it. Compared to the Paris target of two degrees, he identifies the economically optimal path of global warming, reaching 3.5 degrees in 2100, on path to exceed four degrees before 2200. He gets these numbers by blending results from 27 studies of economic damages from climate change, published from 1994 to 2017, including him 10 that he himself authored or co-authored. There are a lot of issues with these studies. For one, in this field, it hardly makes sense to use studies based on science that is more than 50 or 20 years old. But let me dig into some of his numbers. His studies don't take account of committed warming from oceans or feedback loops, and they're based on less than a meter of sea level rise and less aridification than we now expect. A study he uses from 2006 says a large-scale discontinuity only becomes possible when temperature has risen by five degrees. This could be something like the Amazon rainforest burning up, the northern ice cap disappearing, the Gulf Stream shifting south from northern Europe to West Africa, ironically giving London the kind of weather Edmonton, Canada has today, or a collapse of the Indian monsoon. But the most recent IPC report finds a high risk of such event between 1 and 2.5 degrees. His studies before 2000 expect weather-related deaths in the U.S. from climate change to decline as reductions in deaths from cold weather exceeds the increase in deaths from heat. Later, this switches, and a 2017 study, for example, puts the cost of increased deaths at three degrees of warming at 1% of U.S. GDP. None of his studies account for the effect of heat on the ability to work, but this is the biggest cost to the U.S. in a 2018 study at $155 billion a year by 2100 for unconstrained warming. A recent study estimates that heat could cause West Africa and South Asia to lose 5% of work capacity by 2050. A study Nordhaus uses from 2002 estimates 8 million international migrants by 2100, costing $10 billion. But many recent studies estimate 150 to 200 million climate migrants, not all international, by 2050. By, now, by my calculation, caring for 150 million climate migrants would cost about $900 billion a year. And this does not include the harm to these people of being forced to leave their homes. His studies base the value of lives lost and of the destruction of fragile ecosystems in each, on each country, in each country on the willingness to pay of that country's people. But this makes no sense for something caused mainly by carbon pollution from rich industrialized countries and for ecosystems that will be lost forever. For many people, there is something sacred about the planet we live on and all its life forms. For humans to drive hundreds of thousands of species to extinction and to dramatically alter the Earth's ecosystems in, is wrong in ways that economic value does not express. But insofar as governments may use the social cost of carbon to figure out how much resources to devote to addressing the climate crisis, it is important for the prevention of loss of species and ecosystems to be taken into account. There are other issues that go into the kind of carbon tax we ought to have, but Nordhaus's $30 for 2015 and $49 for 2030 are way too low. For the speed of the tr transition to clean energy that we need, we ought to be moving quickly to something in the range of $200 to $250 for ton of CO2 roughly doubling the cost of a gallon of gas. I recognize that this is politically challenging. While scientists and economists underestimate the severity of the climate crisis, many policy analysts overestimate how ready society is to respond to it. Since the Paris Agreement in 2015, the IPCC and many climate policy organizations have come out with programs of action for keeping global heating to the Paris targets. For example, there's a 2017 publication called 2020, The Climate Turning Point by the Carbon Tracker Initiative, Climate Action Tracker, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and Yale Data Driven. They argue that to keep global heating to the 1.5 to 2 degree range, 
Global carbon pollution needs to stop increasing and start declining by 2020 and fall to zero by 2040 to 2050. They propose a program with six critical milestones that must be met by 2020. One, renewables outcompete fossil fuels as new electricity sources worldwide. Two, zero emissions transport is a preferred form of all new mobility in the world's major cities and transport routes. Three, large-scale deforestation is replaced with large-scale land restoration and agriculture shifts to earth-friendly practices. Four, heavy industry, including iron and steel, cement, chemicals, and oil and gas, commits to being Paris compliant. Five, cities and states are implementing policies and regulations to fully decarbonize buildings and infrastructure by 2050. Six, investment in climate action is beyond $1 trillion per year, and all financial institutions have a disclosed transition strategy. To be honest, when I read this program, it makes me feel a little bit queasy. On one hand, I would understand if it were presented with stark logic as, in principle, what it would take to keep global heating below two degrees. In fact, however, it is presented as though it were a plausible program that might actually be adopted by governments and firms around the world by 2020 and actually implemented. This is wildly unrealistic, though, as though the authors are living in some kind of fantasy world. This vision for 2020 is helpful for showing the kinds of programs that are needed. While implausible for 2020, the longer, the longer the global community waits to implement these programs, the more harmful the crisis becomes. Most people around the world do not understand the climate crisis very well. We depend on experts and the authorities. The scientists, however, are saying that we should keep global heating to 1.5 degrees when probably due only to the physical momentum, this is no longer plausible. The economists are saying, well, okay, maybe the optimal path of heating actually takes us to four degrees not well below two degrees, as our governments have committed. And the policy people are saying, no, we actually do need to keep below two degrees, but they give us a program that cannot possibly be implemented. While everyone has to deal with more heat waves and crazy weather, the starkest victims of the climate crisis are climate migrants. Besides people who are killed outright, it is people who lose their homes and livelihoods and who are uprooted from their communities, mostly in the global south, that suffer the greatest harms from the crisis. We already have the highest level of human displacement in history from a variety of causes, and the response we see already is already pretty ugly. The American president wants to build a wall at the southern border and have Mexicans pay for it. To deter further migration, he separates families and keeps children in cages. The European Union has almost fallen apart over increased migration. Turkey wants to send millions of refugees back to Syria. Around the world, the welcome to refugees is wearing thin, and in many places, have rising hostility. In coming decades, however, we are likely to see today's 70 million refugees and internally displaced persons increase to two or 300 million. As the climate crisis advances, it will continue to interact with other pre-existing tensions. It will increase stress on all, all of our institutions. A fundamental challenge is for countries that have generated more carbon pollution to take responsibility for its consequences. But there's a poor fit between this challenge and our system of nation states. As each government promotes its narrow national interests, we could fail to build the stronger global institutions that the world needs to address the problem. It is helpful to define the range of approaches. At one end, there is the politics of the armed lifeboat, as richer countries use their power to block the entry of climate migrants and their militaries to contain conflicts stoked in poorer countries by the climate crisis. The other approach is to strengthen global institutions to confront the common threat. This involves building much stronger institutions for mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, for adaptation, adjusting to its harms, and for supporting victims. Actually, there's only one option. The armed lifeboat cannot contain the climate crisis. It's only a terrible and immensely costly detour. 
Our political leaders, however, and public opinion are not ready to support the Marshall Plan-like effort needed to build a global institutions adequate to the climate crisis. I'm involved in much local organizing to get my community to push for stronger climate action. But local organizing also isn't enough. The global nature of the, of the climate crisis calls for global political organization to promote efi efficient and effective action on a global agenda. But this would have to be the topic for another talk. Thank you.